Hello Linux lovers, my name is Wimpy, welcome to my world. Um, right, uh, hacking on QuickMU again, uh, after its um, surprising success on the internet uh, last week. Attracted a lot of attention from developers and contributors and issue reporters, and I've been gathering up uh, a lot of new contributions and also fixing some of the issues that people have found. Hey Popey, how you doing? <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Um, and I'm going to roll that up into a new release and there's some cracking new features uh, that we've got lined up in this as well. Mostly thanks to other people or at least people pointing out problems as well. So hello, hello Navy Cat. Uh, in fact, uh, there's code of yours in what will be this new release. Hello Danny, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> okay, so last night, Danny, um, we were working on a couple of fixes in Ubuntu Mate, this side, this side, um, that are post-release fixes, most of those coming from Danny. And again, the most significant feature uh, <laughs> that we're going to be taking a look at in what will be the new Quick MU release uh, comes from Danny as well. I'll actually demo that because it's super cool. Um, and Danny is uh, has recently switched over one of their machines at home to Ubuntu Mate, which is the Linux distro that uh, I lead lead the project for. And um, you've decided to find all of the rough edges and fix them, which is absolutely glorious. So this one, um, you've fixed it. Wow. Okay. Um, that's amazing. Thank you very much for working on that. I'm not going to get into that now, but uh, maybe this evening we'll we'll have a look at that one and get that like patched and fixed and in in all the right places because um, that's probably the there's 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 always like a few bugs that are at the top of your mind as like you know a developer of something, and this is in fact basically the the three big ones you've you've addressed in the last week, um, and there are obviously bugs in things, um, but. With these ones fixed, I'm really feeling in a very good place about what is going to become Ubuntu Mate 2204, a full six months before we even, you know, get to work on it. So welcome back, Danny, Popey, uh, Navy Cat and Indie Monkey. Welcome back. Welcome back. Hello. Hello. Uh, and if you've got questions about the Ubuntu release and all the rest of it, I'm sporting... Um, is it? Yeah, I'm sporting the uh, appropriately themed mugs today. Here we go. I've got the two... There, all of the all of the Ubuntu Mate mugs um, with my standard issue two mugs of tea just afternoon I just crept into the morning slot but yeah there we go so let's just uh, flip a couple of things around here so I can see what's going on right then uh, let's have a go at this so uh, let's shoot down here so um, the project uh, is here and I did merge a few things and test a few things last night. I think the best place to start is showing how this new Windows uh, VM install process works uh, thanks to what uh, Danny, um, Danny worked on. So I think we'll just demo that first of all because it doesn't take long to do and everything's much better now um for the windows side of things in fact i'd go as far to say the experience of setting up windows 10 or 11 with quick mu is is you know it's the best vm setup experience now so i've got a directory called cruft which is where i've got a couple of test vms i've been working on uh, and one of those is uh, Windows 11. There's also a little giveaway there. You'll notice this directory, Quick MU GUI, not my work. There are two people uh, working on front ends to Quick MU. They've both elected to use Flutter. And this one that I've been testing is from my good friend and ex co host of the Ubuntu podcast, Mark, Mark Johnson. So they're not too distant future. I'm fully anticipating there will be. Um, well, there'll be at least one. I don't know if there'll be two and they're going to continue. So Yannick's working on one and Mark's working on one. So I don't know if there'll be two and they'll go their own ways or if they're going to collaborate and come together on a single project. So uh, welcome back. Welcome back. Hello, King Egypt. Welcome back. WSL Corsair. <laughs> w Danny is a real beast. Yeah, well, 
uh, Danny's an excellent contributor. Always, um, always a pleasure to work with. Hello, Paddy. Welcome back. How are you doing? Uh, you need a tea warmer device. Um, yeah, maybe. The mugs that I've got from work, which are in my other office, which I can't get to for reasons I'll explain another time, uh, but they've actually got like um, thermal padding at the bottom. And of course I took them over there and I've used them once and there they have stayed ever since. So I, I'm missing them. They're also large. So you get two large mugs of tea, which is great for when you want to sit down and do something like this. Uh, we're not going to make a little li quick MU. Uh, can, can you imagine doing that in Bash? I have raised an issue for myself in the project to make a, in air quotes, very in air quotes API for the front end developers to actually extract like you know the config that's needed to know what distros and releases are supported. Um, Mark has figured out a way of doing that based on the prompts that exist in quick get currently but we'll we'll expand that to something a little bit more formal. Hey welcome back um, uh, Yannick. So um, so Zsync's built into Quick Depth Pad Paddy. It's already there. It already does. It only does that for the Devel images. Um, but the Devel images exclusively use Zsync already. So the front end GUIs don't need to worry about that. They just hook into Quick Get and it does the right thing for them. It's turning out that some of the choices I made with Quick Get and Quick Emu are turning out to be validated um, but you know there's still there's lots of bugs coming over the last week um, and uh, we're getting there it's it's much improved so what we're going to do very quickly is we're going to run the um, dev version um, because we'll release this just a little bit later but we'll we'll look at I've got a Windows 11 here so I'm going to just delete that and when you use the delete command with quick MU it doesn't actually um, delete everything it deletes the virtual machine disk and the EFI variables so at this point what's left intact is um, all of the assets that are required to um, get Windows going so the uh, Windows 11 ISO itself the vert IO stuff and now this unattended ISO here now I wonder if I can take a peek inside this and demonstrate what this new feature is. So before the unattended ISO had one thing inside it which was the XML which drives or automates part of the Windows installation. Now Danny has added a bunch of features to that. I think I can do it through a UI as well Danny. I'll, I'll, I'll look at that in a second. Danny has added to that so that that unattended install now has everything inside it to pre-install all of the vert IO drivers inside the VM in that first instance. So everything that vert IO provides is now injected into that VM at install time. And then through a conversation, I think it was with the mentor, um, Danny had figured out there was a few things that we had as like post-install steps and automated that by having Windows curl those down and install them in the first run. But then uh, the mentor suggested, well, why don't we put those inside the unattended ISO as well? So Quick, De Quick Get does all of the downloading and then those are, that's exposed to the VM and is already safely available. So that's what we've done. So let's just see if I can do this. If I go to Cruft, ugh. I go to Cruft and Windows 11 I think I think I can do this uh, open with disk image mounter there we go so now you can see inside this ISO image there's our XML and here is the MSI's for the things that were a manual post install step and all of this is automated as well now <laughs> i as much as i love the command line uh having you know grown up with uh linux on the desktop when there's nice ui solutions to things i prefer to prefer to use them so if we just take a look in here um uh oh uh can i even zoom i don't know that's um that's not the best. Well, that will have to do. So there's a bunch of stuff that's unchanged in here, but where it gets interesting is this bit. So this is the piece that Danny's fleshed out. 
So now you can see here all of the drivers from Vert IO are referenced here to instruct Windows what to do. And then further down here, we have these steps, which are a first, uh, there is this first logon commands. So this bunch of stuff here Thank you for the will now run. Thanks very much for, wow, that's a complicated collection of letters, but thank you very much for the follow and welcome to the stream. Um, so these are three uh, first run uh, commands that will run to inject the rest of what uh, a Windows machine needs to be fully optimized under QMU. So this is terrific. And that's what we'll just run through now because there's a couple of like important changes to um, how how all of this behaves in terms of the install experience and it's being it's much more sort of fluid and straightforward now so we'll um we'll run up our vm we won't run delete we'll actually start it um and there's another bit that i added back due to popular <laughs> request that i had removed um in the past uh, i'm stuck inside there so let's just free myself there we go so this is the windows 11 booting up um it started off the off that iso image and um what i've added back here is the uh samba support so um if you've got smbd on your system uh, there's a feature in QMU where you can expose uh, a share to the guest and that's kind of built in providing that that's available. So I've added that back but I've not made Samba a hard requirement on the on the application working. If it detects it's got the necessary stuff it will do this and I've written up some docs on how to install the very minimal amount of Samba on an Ubuntu system to make that work. And that's because people pointed out that this was, you know, fast and reliable. So what you'll notice here is we didn't get asked what version of Windows do we want to install. We didn't get asked about the disk partitioning. Um, we didn't go through the EULA stuff. We're just straight into bits being put on our virtual disk. So let me just let me just catch up on the chat here. So um we've talked about the zsync stuff um so paddy says hey takov welcome back so um don in the uk hello um paddy says i used quick emu to set up windows 11 vm and the experience was absolutely wonderful well thank you thank you for that feedback that is that is what we're aiming for for sure um and then yannick says we gooey guys are a lazy bunch <laughs> the less we do the better we feel yeah well it's it, you know if there's an interest in making these uis then you know it's not too much work to to make that more useful to those people so um uh <laughs> yannick says gooey's are for the week real people use the clay no it's that's rubbish um i don't agree i think the terminal is the ultimate keyboard macro but you don't need to use it but if you can flex it it's a really useful tool um and can someone please tell me what bits are <laughs> is it? no we don't do t uh, we do do we have t we do have bits in this channel it's our channel points are called tux though um so now the vm's restarting okay so it's done the initial uh like basic install and now we're going to go into like the first setup wizard that windows has and again some of this we obviously have to complete because it's you know a process you have to go through but bits of it have been automated out um but the first thing uh that we'll notice is that the resolution just changed and that's because all of the graphics drivers are present now for the uh, virtualized um, graphics card. So Windows is now going to run in a higher resolution in this first install uh, wizard. And this is great because it makes actually navigating through those menus that you have to go through that much quicker and easier to read. So um, that's a, a real improvement. And of course, we're going to come out of the... Uh, end of the install with a fully configured fully optimized vm without having 
any instructions to say to people, oh, by the way, now download these things and install this extra stuff. So this is just, you know, fantastic, I think. Hello, camera, welcome back. It's been a while, how you doing? Well, every year's the year of the Linux desktop. This year's the year of the Linux desktop, surely. I mean, uh, we've got um, the Steam Deck. Uh, I think some people may receive their Steam Decks this year. That's running uh, Plasma, right? Or at least some of Plasma. Uh, so there's the Linux desktop. And of course, uh, Windows 11 is now the biggest access point to the Linux desktop because it's got WSL baked in uh, and easily accessible. So we can now see immediately this initial setup wizard is going to be much easier to navigate because it's running at uh, 1024 by 768 instead of, um, I think it was 640 by 480 or something before, which was very cramped and awkward to navigate. So we can just whiz through this and actually get through it a bit quicker. <laughs> camera says i'm good you're sad to see that the ubuntu podcast has ended yeah but i'm glad you're still doing cool stuff here i think what's interesting um i'm not uh, if alan is still here i'm not going to give anything away i promise i think what's interesting is the reasons we gave for why we wanted to sort of you know wrap up the ubuntu podcast is there are other things we're interested in doing i've obviously been doing some of this streaming stuff on and off for a while but it's freed me up to do more of it, uh, which I'm thoroughly enjoying because I'm getting connected with uh, a wider community of developers. We did a four hop raid at uh, four hops on a raid hop last night. Found two really really interesting retro gaming channels as a as a result of doing that. So that was good fun. Um, so you know I'm doing more of this stuff and trying to expand beyond just working on Ubuntu Mate and trying to get some other projects that I want to work on out there and already you know we as we saw earlier Mark now he's got a bit more free time he started building a UI for QuickMU because he's got a bit more free time and I am in conversations with Alan on a very different kind of project and collaboration and i'm very excited for it and next week hopefully he and i we're not going to reveal anything next week but hopefully next week he and i will be able to do a bit more work on this but this is going to be a real fun project i'm really i'm really quite looking forward to it so um so yeah i think you'll see the three of us producing different things as a result of having a bit more time on our hands so Continuing with the wizard, we're going to go through the usual thing. And now it's much easier to see the sign-in options. You know, that was sort of buried before and as was this. So it's much easier to actually, uh, you know, set things up the way you want to do your setup. And uh, I think what you, you can all see where this is heading because um, my password is test, by the way. And um, I think you all know that uh, my, uh, my first pet's name was test and um, the city uh, where I is also test and uh, last but not least my childhood nickname was um, was test there we go so that's all of those important security questions answered <laughs> so uh, what have we got here uh, okay so uh, Paddy says not to distract you too much, but whilst you're in Windows 11, you install the Power Toys preview and have a look at the keyboard remap. I'm not going to do that today. I don't want to get too far off detour because once we've like demoed that this is a much improved experience, we're going to get into preparing the new release. So um, I, I won't do that today, but maybe we can circle back to that uh, on another occasion. Uh, we don't need find my device. So these are all easier to find the hit points for and get through this um, set of questions. There we go. So I think at this point it's just going to whir for a bit now and do do its do its thing, give us that nice deep blue screen for a little moment, uh, and then we should get a desktop. And I don't th I think I I ran through this last night and it's just going to. Um, 
<clears throat> it's just going to uh, run those commands silently in the background so you won't even know that you know the these extra bits are being installed but you know they are so uh, let's have a look here um, what was my other question so yeah we can I, I see the question uh, remap keyboard remap in the GUI you can do some of that in Mate for sure. Like one of the things I do with the Mate keyboard configuration is I disable caps lock entirely. Um, I've never used that button in my whole entire life. So I simply just outright disable it. I don't need it. It's of no value to me. I wish there was something more useful on that button. I have thought about mapping it to, you know, something, but I don't know what that something would be. <laughs> um, no, not 16 bit verses. Um, I'd, I'd love to have another crack at 8-bit verses with Popey if uh, we're able to find the time. I had bags of fun doing that. <laughs> right, there we go. So there's our um, uh, system all, all up and running. And at this point, because all of the drivers are installed, um, we can just get rid of that. We can right-click the desktop, go into display settings, and immediately bump this to well for this screen we can probably go that far without it doing anything crazy keep those changes and there we go so all of the all of the drivers are installed the whole lot and if we just bring up the um, Explorer because this is still the first run here we can see the attached drive which is all of our IO drivers and then CD-ROM F is there it is this is our config our unattended configuration uh, CD and there's our unintended com configs and here are the three um, installers that uh, Danny's script automatically installs and we're done that was it uh, Windows 11 installed no no further work to be done you can just start using it now everything you need uh, to fully interact with that guest host stuff um, is all done so let's have a look um uh looking forward to all of that says camera double the verses <laughs> um how many questions i i i i try and field the questions so yami yuki senpai says that looks smooth what's what's the gpu well, the GPU in the host is um, kind of irrelevant at the moment for Windows because it doesn't do a, a, You can see here um, what we were doing there is this is the, the video configuration. So the guest is using the QXL VGA, which is somewhat accelerated, but not very accelerated. But it is the most accelerated Windows experience we can offer without you having to know how any of that gubbins works it just figures out the best way to do things for you on your system so you will get the best performance possible that your computer is capable of delivering what we can do next to make this very optimized is PCI pass-through of the host GPU and that is something I'm going to tackle in the future I think I just need a few days to um, stabilize this get a few more bugs fixed and a couple of features implemented a little bit of internal refactoring to better accommodate this and then I want to tackle actual GPU pass through um, and Wendell from level one techs who has an interest in that and has been involved in the looking glass project um, pinged me on Twitter and I think we're going to get together to see how we can you know make this happen in a in a slick way i'd like the gpu pass through to be as easy to expose as the rest of uh how quick mu and quick get operate so that's the idea uh yeah so paddy says that we've got this feature as well which is display spice uh, and that just then, uh, instead of opening in uh, an SDL rendered window, actually uses the Spicy client. Uh, and the Spice client is a thing that enables us to do several things. Um, I might be able to do this to some extent at least. So um, 
in in here we have a couple of options one is select uh, usb devices for redirection so let's do that with i won't do my stream deck or my audio card um there we go there's a controller i'm not currently using so there we go and you heard the dink so that controller is now passed through to this uh, VM. So this is one of the advantages of the SPICE. Uh, and then you can disable this and disconnect it. And then the, uh, the other thing that SPICE enables is um, things like um, copy paste between the guest and the host and all the rest of it. And what I'm thinking of doing is making the SPICE execution the default. It's not the most optimized, but I think it's the most useful. So for those people that do want the full GPU acceleration, you can go back to display SDL to get the best performance. But I think most of the time people want the sort of slick integration between the guest and the host. So I think we'll make Spice the default at some point. Anyway, there we go. Uh, I've installed Windows a lot in uh, recent times. Um, and it's got faster and faster and it's much improved oops much improved now so there we go oh i missed it and let's shut that box down so um so speedy b says if you want to keep the vm around for the long term will you have to add a license there is a curious side effect of quick MU, and this is not by design. This is entirely accidental. And I shall show you this. I'm going to start this VM again. Um, because in order to answer your question, I need to show you something. And then I need to explain, because otherwise people are going to think I'm up to no good. And I'm really not. So if we go in here and we search for activation settings in windows you will notice that this is activated as is a windows 10 install managed by uh, quick mu so how did that happen well it wasn't deliberate you will find in that unattended xml there is a license key but it is not an actual license key for a product. It's a license key that Microsoft make available and document as a way to automatically select the version of Windows that gets installed by the automated process. Um, and that's what automatically selects the pro version of uh, Windows from the, from the downloaded ISO. And uh, yeah, and so this is so I've I've had a chat to a couple of people, and this is my hypothesis, because QuickMU uses all of the optimization features that are available through uh, Vert.io and all of the rest of it. I think the um, in air quotes hardware fingerprint of Windows machines that are created by QuickMU very closely match what the large system integrators have volume licensing for and i think it's being automatically activated because it looks like one of their vms and that's the that's the best explanation i can come up with based on talking to a few people so curiously it is fully activated i don't know if that will last but there it is um it's a weird it's a weird side effect of you know the way that this stuff has been uh, created but uh, hopefully that answers your question um speedy b or at least gives you some insight you can change the key if you have one of your own of course right then so um hello there <laughs> hello there adam how you doing welcome back um it's reporting the agent it isn't running that's not right uh what i didn't see that i uh that 
I, I need to move on to actually getting the release done, I think. So uh, Danny says it's a difficult one. We're not purposely doing anything, yeah, to force the activation. So hopefully, Danny, I've given, I've shone some light on why I think it's happening. Um, yeah, so that's my, so you said about logging into Atos. That's, that's my theory, is that it's actually uh, coming up on the, uh, getting activated through the hardware fingerprinting as one of the Atos volume licensing things is what I think. And I think it's Atos because they are so massive. Um, and they're the only organization that could, you know, pay Microsoft enough money to just have those activations come on, you know, automatically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> King Egypt says, mm, shuffles over to Quick M, you innocently. Yeah, there we go. So uh, hopefully that, that makes sense. So uh, there we go. So that's the significant new feature. And then in this directory, you will also see that I have um, Fedora here. Uh, and I think it was the mentor added this, but we got a contribution to add Fedora support. So if we just head over to the project, we'll open this up in another tab as well. And then we'll look at the commits here. So here we go. These are, this is the merge of everything that Danny worked Thank on. Thank you for the follow, Armtech9. Hey, Armtech, thanks very much for the follow and thanks for stopping by the stream. So here's all Danny's work, which I've just demonstrated. All of that, you know, automate all of the things uh, in the Windows setup. So that's good. And then we've got um, the mentor here added Fedora support. Thank you for the follow, Danny Verp. Hey, Danny Verp, thanks very much for following. Welcome to the stream. Um, and um, Yannick added support for Impish because obviously Ubuntu 21.10 came out yesterday and I did some streams on that last night. So um, one of the reasons I want to get this out is because uh, it, it will, you know, make it easy for people to run that. And then uh, this was me closing some bugs out. People have reported some things. Uh, somebody trying to get it to work on Mac OS said, I'm using bash four features in the script and could I change it to bash three? And my initial response was absolutely not. And I thought, well, I need to justify this in some reasonable way. Turns out bash four has been in the wild since 2009. So the fact Mac OS is still using bash three by default is sad and I've just documented the fact that bash 4 is an absolute requirement and I'm deliberately using bash 4 features in the in the script to preserve my sanity. Uh, Navy Cat, who's here in stream with us, uh, improved the port scanning. So when, um, when uh, a VM starts up, um, it will automatically expose SSH ports and uh, SPICE ports. And the way I used to do it is pick a random port in a range and uh, Navy Cat has made that a uh, linear um, thing and also fixed a problem where it could potentially get stuck in an infinite loop. So that's terrific. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, and oh yeah, some people were trying to run this on really low end hardware and it was creating VMs with not enough actual you know system requirements for mac os and windows so i've rejigged the way the automatic um, evaluation of the host system works and it will do the best it can but if it catches you're trying to run mac or windows and you haven't got enough uh, resources allocated to the vm it will hard stop and tell you sorry uh, your computer's not up to the job um, we've added some uh, checking of uh, integrity checking for some of the Windows downloads and some of the other bits and pieces. Fixed a bunch of bugs, basically. Um, so this was lots of stuff that got reported. So as you can see, I think it was around... It was around here that it got featured on Hacker News and then last weekend I'd spent literally most of the Saturday just going through the issue tracker and fixing stuff that people had reported which is good because now it's a much more robust tool than it was you know a week ago so I can see there's a bunch of people asking questions again that I've missed so let's have a look here um, 
uh finally got one of the streams well welcome glad, glad you can make it hello paul welcome back how are you doing today um so i think mac os uses uh, zsh by default yes they do that's the default shell that a user gets when you open a terminal now but this quick mu is a script that's written in bash it doesn't change the fact that you may have zsh as your default shell this is the same as if you have a script written in Python, Python is the interpreter that is going to run that script. This script is written in Bash, therefore Bash is the interpreter that is going to run this script. Um, uh, yes, and we're all agreeing that ZSH is indeed the default shell. Um, I saw, what was it, what, one of the distros that I installed the other day. I think it was GhostBSD. Um, I was installing GhostBSD. Um, I don't know it, how compatible bash scripts are when they're interpreted by ZSH. Um, I've never never looked into that. Um, and GhostBSD has the fish shell by default. And that really got me thinking, I'm so tempted to do that in Ubuntu Mate, make the fish shell the default shell for the user. You know, so when you... Because I use the fish shell, it'll be one less step for me. Most BSDs are using ZSH. Yeah, ZSH is very popular. I just love fish. It's just fantastic. So anyway, this is um, a bunch of the improvements. So I think what we'll do is we'll head over here to the releases page. So the last release we put out was 2.23, which was a week ago. Um, and yeah, there was some stuff here. So you know but we need thank we, you for the follow grexit there thanks very much for the follow and welcome to the stream so oh, i'm not signed in every time why doesn't it remember this right one moment i'm just going to uh drag this over here and sign in over here very quickly right then so uh, those of you that are here, uh, any of you already upgraded to one of the Ubuntu's, the 2110 release that came out yesterday? Uh, always interesting to see how many people here are uh, avid Linux users and of those who's following along with, with what, what's happening in Ubuntu. Um, on this machine I am not, I'm still running 2104. I'll probably upgrade over the weekend for this machine. I need to check Oh, man. Right. Right. There we go. Right, I am logged in. That's good. Let's pull that back down here. So we're going to start the um, new release process. I say the new release process, it's not that complicated really so we're going to draft a new release this is going to be thank you for the follow chaos for the fly <laughs> thanks very much for the follow so <laughs> i'm still on 1604 lts wow the lts is certainly are sticky we we've definitely seen that before what is it what is it that's keeping you on 1604 um so changes we've got a lot of changes here to cover so we will say um let's go and look at what uh some of danny's um commits were yeah let's say um we'll say thanks like so so this is going to be all of the things rolled up um So this is thanks to the mentor. There we go. Uh, 
what is Yannick on here? No, your, your usernames uh, are different in different. There we go. That's you here. Uh, so let's see what other commits we need to review to get the change log done. Wow, everyone's talking about Ubuntu. Let's just have a quick look here. So, um, yeah, fish is just wonderful. I love it. Uh, that's an interesting idea. Um, there are some things you don't want, you know, users to have to choose between. You updated last night, Speedy B. Okay, Danny's still on the beta. Haven't done an apt upgrade for a few days. Okay, so you're just an apt update, apt upgrade away. Uh, Lucid Links did. Okay, pretty standard stuff. Nothing too amazing. Uh, are you running uh, proper Ubuntu 2110 there? Um, so Jeff is doing his upgrades over the weekend. Yeah, I will probably do the same. I need to just check one driver that is an out of tree kernel driver is going to work on the new release before I'd make the jump. Um, uh, so Speedy B says since 2004, they've been updating, uh, with each new interim release. Um, Yannick has upgraded two VMs. Uh, on the main machine. Uh, wait a bit to install uh, Ubuntu Mate right now, but it's running proper Ubuntu. Um, and Armtech says, what's keeping me on 1604? Probably the stability with the NVIDIA drivers. I'm using NVIDIA right now on 2104. I've not had a problem with them. In fact, I think the NVIDIA driver supports improved significantly in 2004. Uh, unless you're on like a, you've got an older GPU and you need you know a particular driver from that version of course pardon me um <laughs> see this speedy b is calling out danny for yet another fix danny is all over the community at the moment uh indie monkey says i'm using ubuntu at work and arco an arch type at home okay might change to ubuntu mate at home wise yeah the chelsea cucumber edition is very good <laughs> Um, I'm using uh, CUDA stuff. Okay, okay, fair enough. So you've got a reliable setup and you just don't want to fiddle around with it. I get that. That's fine. Um, uh, Carwin says, I like the LTSs because uh, I don't need to change my computers very often. That is very true. Uh, you know, if I wanted the easy life, I'd do the same. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I've sort of made the newer version of the Mate desktop a, as a backport PPA for um, those people on Focal now. So those people people running Ubuntu Mate 2004 can uplift the desktop environment and basically get all the good stuff that we just did in this last six months for 2110. Because I, I understand, you know, having worked at Canonical on the desktop team, I know how sticky those LTS releases are. They are like, there are like 20 times more people on the LTSs. <clears throat> um, upgrade via the GUI or the CLI. So Yannick asks that question, upgrade via the GUI or the CLI. The only supported way to do it, Yannick, really, is uh, via the upgrade manager tooling, which is a GUI on the desktop. Um, the CLI way of doing it is actually designed for server, not for the desktop. <clears throat> So I've got an old Dell here with 1010. Wow. <laughs> oh, that was that was one of the uh, last GNOME 2 versions, I think. 1010, wasn't it? I think that was the last, wasn't it 1104 when um, sort of Unity started to be introduced. Um, right, okay. So lots of you uh, are, are updating or planning to update. So let's uh, see what else we've got in the release notes here. That's not noteworthy. That's not noteworthy. Ah, we'll have the improved port scanning. There we go. And that's Navy Cat. Okay, let's have a look. What else have we got here? Um, okay. Um, I shall say fixed. Creating VMs with inadequate resources to run Windows 
or Mac OS. So let's have a look. What else have we got here? Um, yeah, fixed. Disk size. Let's see now, what else have we got? Uh, we'll say added. There we go. We added that. Um, Oh yeah, we fixed uh, the. Nine <laughs> P tag size. Uh, let's have a look here. You have a disk with Linux one dot I think the first Linux distro I installed was like. 0.99 patch level 2 or something I seem to remember when patch levels were a thing <laughs> it is it hasn't aged well <laughs> uh, yeah interesting right then um, oh yeah we had this um, so we need to say Oh, we've got uh, this here. This was quite a big chunk of work. Added um, multi distro support for OVMF firmware detection. There we go. That was something we did. Uh, that's not really that important. That's a syntax error. Correct Samba to use. Oh, okay. Re so let's just say um, added. We added that. And I think that might be the highlights because now we're down here to this one, which was just a bunch of bug fixes. And then we had this release and we, we had a bunch of stuff. So I think that's the highlights. Um, I think that will probably, probably do it. I think that summarizes it all pretty well. So there's our release. Um, why is that? Why does that want a comma? Why do you want a comma there and not on the others? Honestly. Right then, let's uh, do that then. So there it is. Way look at look at all those happy happy contributors down there. That's that's good, isn't it? <clears throat> so um, uh, let's see what we got here. Um, Yeah, hopefully I got that. I saw that typo. Thanks, uh, Danny. Um, I can go back and edit. I feel... <laughs> Who's done that? Who was that? <laughs> Navy Cat, thank you very much. This is this is the only channel point uh, redeem I've left behind. I'm going... Next week, I'm going to be working on more of that silliness uh, so people can have some fun with um, channel points. Um, so people reminiscing over their uh, favorite Ubuntu's from the past uh, does the windows uh, allow to add our own stuff um, well you'd have to fork the project and but yes then you could adapt you could add to it but it doesn't give you the ability to edit it no but you could fork fork it and add your own add your own stuff <clears throat> Winget is installed out of the box. Okay. Um, so it, I had to install it. Perhaps the full release has it pre-installed. 
well there's a discussion i don't know i've never used winget so lichen says my first main linux that got me to install and use was ubuntu mate 1404 wow back in the day and uh, but you used to use the nopix cds yeah yeah those were very popular at the lugs uh, of that era i remember um there was a nopix something for every uh use so that's the the basic release is done um i will come over here and move to where my packaging exists for this which is collection debian packaging here we go so we that was the last release we did so we'll do dch minus v we're going to bump this to 2.2.4 new upstream release um, and we will Debian change log and we will release this for vocal initially Uh, that should do everything I need there. Yeah. Okay. Make a source pack. Ah, oh, hang on a minute. I cannot open. Oh, really? Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. I'm in the wrong directory. Um... Um, come on brain um, what directory is it in it's Debian packaging there we go so let's uh, let's do that uh, but now we need to pull down the the new source tarball that we just made upstream there we go so that pulls down that and now we can build a source tarball like so we need to sign that and we can deput that to whoops Mu and upload this one and then we'll just iterate around each of those and do one for uh, a suit save that so <laughs> Nopix was my first go-to, then Mandrake. I'm aware of Mandrake, I never used it. I know it's popular amongst, um, let's say, the um, older generation, uh, our lug. Uh, they, would all, they would all rave about Mandrake. Um, so we'll put that one up, which is for his suit. Uh, I have done that typo many times in the last six months and then we'll do one for impish um, right then so we'll save that do that and push this one up for impish so those should be building in the PPA and I started writing a little bit of additional document. In fact, is the XDG stuff back in here yet? I probably need to add that back as I think it needs to be in there. So let's just find um, XDG does. Um, maybe that is it. Yes, this is what we want. So we're going to copy that. Yep, that's the right thing. So we're going to add that back to the docs, um, which is probably going to be down here somewhere. So, um, 
let's put that URL in. One of the contributors removed this line from the documentation because they patched out the absolute requirement to have it. But if you do that, you, you miss the user sharing stuff, uh, the file sharing stuff, because it can't find your localized name of your public uh, directory otherwise. So X user dears, we're missing a character there. So we'll add that back in. So um, what have we got here? I'm surprised QuickMU is not a snap. Well, the thing is, is if it were a snap, it would need to be a classic snap because it forks things. So without any of the confinement stuff, it's it was a snap originally. Uh, and then a few weeks ago, I switched it back to not being a snap. Um, so yeah, it when, when it's something that needs to be a classic snap, I, I kind of, there's as many accommodations for a snap being classic to overcome that it just becomes easier to not not do that. Um, so yeah, unless it's something like Go or Rust, then those sit inside classic snaps very nicely. <clears throat> yeah. Um, did you ever guy? Did I ever use Crunchbang? Uh, not actually use use. I'm obviously aware of it and um, had tried it out in VMs and things. There's a lot to like there. Well, that was a pretty great distro at the time and you know, met Phil a few times at, you know, Og Camp and what have you and chatted over beers and stuff. Um, sounds like Popey still got it running on some antiquated ThinkPad somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but Bunsen, as Popey points out, uh, it did get sort of a, a continuation via Bunsen Labs. Um, I don't know. I think it was fairly... Uh, true to the original um, sort of agenda for um, for, bun uh, for crunch bang. Yeah, classic snaps. They're a special breed, and when you you don't you can't just make a classic snap and expect it to work unless you know what you're doing as a developer. There are some considerations to be aware of. Right. Okay. So I've added that and then yeah I was just saying I added um I added something down here which was uh file sharing related it's probably way down the bottom of the docs these docs are getting quite lengthy here we go so I just added this bit here on samba um so I think what we'll do is we'll just look at what we've got here um in fact I won't do it with the command line way let's bring up the oh so wonderful git kraken so if we take <laughs> tc thank you very much <laughs> uh if we take a look so all we have outstanding are these doc changes so i'll just get those pushed up um we'll just stage all of that and just say update read me So, because uh, that's not anything that's important to be included in like a, a release because it's like a living document, if you will. Um, so, um, yeah, exactly. I think Danny, that's good advice. Danny says there, you know, if you ever find yourself thinking, I really want to make a classic snap, then stop and think. The, the, the place where classic snaps are absolutely essential is if it's a terminal application because it needs to launch arbitrary commands and more often than not if it's a, a code editor or an IDE again for the reason that it wants to launch arbitrary applications those are kind and then it was also made for things like utility so you know something like quick MU um, you know you just want to be able to bun bundle up a utility because um, it was a before they were called classics internally we were referring to them as like you it was a utility mode um, was the original name but that's going back to like 2016 and then it became classic as it got in, introduced but um, especially when they're graphical applications when they become classic they're very awkward to work with uh, from a developer point of view um, but if you need that agility of deployment, then maybe it's worth working around, uh, working with. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Popey makes the point that the idea was is that Classic was an interim uh, solution until something better came along. And I think the something better was confined snaps would have additional interfaces that you could request to enable you to execute arbitrary binaries and do some of the things that Classic was there to sort of facilitate. But Popey says that's, that's not happened so far. Right, um, let's just go back to the project and we'll just have a little look. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few things that are going to be coming up. So, um, I've already had to close a request like this before. So let's see if I can find the one that previously asked for server-based distros. <clears throat> and I will mark it. There we go. Add. It was 64, uh, 84. So that's a duplicate of 84. Um, honestly, who sends patches in GitHub comments? What that, that is, is that a thing? Is that something that people people do? I mean, why would you do that? Close with comment. So let's uh, see if there's anything else we can close out. So this is an interesting one. Uh, I had to read that carefully to understand what they were driving at. Uh, this one and this one are kind of the same, but I've got not got enough information from either of them to do anything useful with those at the moment. This one I think I know how to fix, but I'll, I'm not going to do now, but I think maybe not specifying uh, ultra optimizations in the disk subsystem may resolve some of this if you're trying to run VMs off an encrypted file system, for example, is when you run into this error. Uh, machine readable. So this is one that I added. This is the feature for uh, to help those um, uh, GUI creators to make it easier to build the GUI. And then this is something I want to do is add some basic uh, host information to the status messages so that when people are reporting bugs, I can ask them to run a particular command and then it gives me some insight on what they're running on. Because it turns out a lot of the bugs I was fixing was because the places, the paths and things where things exist on Arch and Fedora are different from Ubuntu and Debian. So, But unless people tell you the distro, it's difficult to know why it's not working for them. So I, I thought I'll build some of that into the status messages. Uh, this person, I think, is just asking for tech support, which is not what issue trackers are for. So I'll I'll deal with that one uh, at some point. But I need to check a fact before I close that issue with um, uh, an appropriate message. Uh, documentation missing dependencies in the readme. Oh yeah, so there was this whole discussion here, and I thought I'm not going to do this. Um, because first of all, they're saying I I had to do all of this without actually reading the documentation that exists. And all of this stuff is useful. But some of this you have to think to yourself, I've built and provided the necessary tools. If somebody else is on a different distro, I'm not going to install another distro, figure out how to build and deliver QMU on insert name of other distro. If they're interested in that, they can take it on. So I've marked this good first issue. It's not something I'm going to deal with, but maybe somebody else will come along and, you know, close that one out. So there's a point where you sort of get a little bit like, ah, well, this is interesting, but I'm not going to do it. But I'm not going to, if some, somebody works on it, I'll gladly accept it. Um, and this one I'm still thinking about. Uh, I think I've got an idea about, about how to do this. And this one was originally verify every bit of thing, every every download that Quick Quick Get does, and that's not possible because not everything that it downloads has a shar or something upstream to compare against. So I've changed it to verify the downloaded content where possible, and I have implemented that. The original requester is like verify the macOS stuff, which requires writing an algorithm to pass the chunk list. And again, I'm not super interested in doing that, but I'll leave that one there and see if anyone decides to pick it up because there's some references in there about how it could potentially be done. Right, 
<laughs> so I can see there's some interesting comments coming around here. Um, let's have a look here. <laughs> Popey says, <laughs> you'd be surprised how many people don't know how to use GitHub. Yeah, uh, I know uh, <laughs> we're special. <laughs> um, I want to join Popey Hub. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Popey uses Bazaar. Yeah, I you, you've you've resisted Git a little bit. I mean, I know you use it and you know how to use it, but I know you you have a soft spot for Bazaar in your heart. Probably the Launchpad integration in particular. <clears throat> so Paddy says on the subject of Git, you made a video some time about about creating a snap. In that video, you provided a nice clear Git workflow that I learned a lot from. Please, if you have have the time, do more of that. Uh, okay, uh, what was my Git workflow? Um, I'd be in, what, what was I, um, what was I, what was I packaging up? Um, oh, Popey did, Popey did his Git workflow. That wasn't me. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and Popey is doing more of the telecasts, by the way. Um, so when you started this project, did you ever thought it would become so big and popular? No. Uh, um, it was niche interest and it was initially designed for the the community that was being stood up at the time of people that wanted to help test and QA Ubuntu releases. So it was really aimed at that group of people which numbers about, let's have, let's have a look, I can actually look, there are 130 people in that community. So this was a tool I thought would be uh, useful to 130 people. And then for the lols, we started working on Mac OS and then we've picked up to two and a half thousand stars in the last week as a result of it. <laughs> um, trending on Hacker News. So yeah, that was a surprise. I suppose as a developer, like a software maker, uh, this is a bucket list item that I can tick off now. You know, made, made it to the top of Hacker News for a full day. Tick. That will never happen again um but that was you know it's pleasing all the same so uh so yeah so there's a bunch of you know fixes and improvements that need to be done here but it's not too tragic you know nothing in here is too awful i think most people are getting a decent experience from uh quick mu um <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, it's it's nice. You know, if you make stuff, it's 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 a double-edged sword. One of the things that I like about Ubuntu Mate is that people use it. And then one of the things that terrifies me about Ubuntu Mate is how many people use it. <laughs> because um you know, you get quite anxious about um how widely used your thing is and you're very conscious of that as you're developing and especially as we saw in in the last 48 hours of this release some really nasty bugs were in the in the platform and at the back of my mind is just how Thank many people you for the that... follow avery salty biscuit wizard <laughs> nice nice name they thanks for stopping by and thanks for the follow so yeah um i i am quite mindful of that and it's you know rewarding and terrifying in equal measure um so yeah um yeah maybe one day i'll go in and show you how many how many active users of ubuntu mate there are it's not as many as you would think but more 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 than i'm comfortable with uh it makes me worry read only friday what's this um I've missed something here. Um, <laughs> well done, pass me, says Popey. Hey, Phil, welcome back. Um, but you could put shards in the code. I could, but there, it, for some of the things it's downloading, it's downloading latest. Like for the Vert IO drivers, it's not downloading a version, it's downloading the latest release that's available because that revs fast. So I can't, I can't keep up with that. Um, so I don't want to do it. <laughs> um, let's have a look. Um, don't break wrong. Thank you for following. Read only Friday. Mm. Uh, what is this read only Friday idea? I'm not sure I follow. 
oh we tend to do right try not to push anything to production yes absolutely yeah i've I, i've certainly instituted um policies like that at places i've worked in the past where um uh, we don't push to prod um either on a friday or especially before a bank holiday and things like that you know you don't want to push and then interrupt people's weekends and downtime uh because something accidentally broke um i think with the improvement because this was going back some time when i was doing that sort of thing but with the improvements in CICD these days you can relax that uh quite a bit because you you should should have a high degree of confidence that your stuff is in a shippable state at all times um so that's less of a concern but nevertheless you know uh for smaller outfits that's still a that's still a you know viable tactic for ensuring you you don't spoil people's weekends yeah potentially breaking changes on friday yeah yeah always on thursdays yeah so a bunch of releases are always on thursdays and that's also to give give us or give the release team one day buffer in case things have really gone badly and the wheels are coming off you can go into the friday which we had to do for the 1804 release i remember thank being you for in the a... follow xx supercube rxx <laughs> thanks very much for the follow another great name hey navy cat thanks for that there full screen full screen uh, confetti um i remember being in a bar in spain at two o'clock in the morning uh on the what was then the friday of the release of 1804 and uh this bar was about to close and we brought most of ubucon europe into the bar with my laptop and we basically bribed them with saying we were going to buy all of these people drinks if they kept the bar open and can give us an internet connection <laughs> because the uh the isos got respun at like midnight uh on the you know uh, what was the end of the thursday release window um we were there for another three hours all testing doing the qa because all of the flavors needed to be retested so we'd got most of ubucon europe in this bar in spain with laptops out testing <laughs> insert name of favorite favorite ubuntu flavor uh, in order to get the release done so that was that was fun and exhausting in equal measure um uh yep yeah i think i i saw there was a release party on the ubuntu on air channel yesterday well we've got the release out uh we've put that in a ppa um and i've just looked at like what's coming next and we did a nice demo of that that excellent new stuff that uh, danny's brought to uh, windows so i think that uh, i'll wrap that up there now i also stream over on the slim devops channel so uh, i'll be streaming there later on today uh we're doing stuff from kubecon this week so if you uh i've just just been talking about optimized virtual machines if you like a bit of optimized containers in your life then uh that's what we do over there so uh you know get following over there and come and join me uh we'll be streaming what time is it today at around 7 p.m my time so 7 p.m in the uk 8 p.m in europe uh what's that it's about 11 a.m pacific time in the us something like that so um we've got a whole bunch of kubecon wrapping wrapping up our week at kubecon i'm obviously in the uk but i've been doing the whole virtual thing so um thank you everyone for stopping by i may stream tonight um here uh because danny has got a fix for an important component in ubuntu mate and i am very eager to check that out so i may stream here again later tonight to uh take a look at that and get that incorporated and released into the various places so uh if you're around later maybe i'll see you for uh, a pint instead of a, a cup of tea because i usually uh pour myself uh, a long cold glass of beer whilst i do some late night you know hacking so maybe i'll see you then um brilliant danny that would be great and maybe what i should do danny is get you into the um into the discord on air channel so uh you can join me as uh, like a voice guest on the stream because i think that would be easier for us to communicate and you to explain what i'm doing wrong <laughs> oh we should go raiding 
we should go raiding. We found some great, um, some great uh, channels last night. So let's just take a little look and see who's doing interesting stuff. We found uh, one of my favorite Commodore 64 programmers last night working on a game. Uh, and then we bounced through uh, several, um, several uh, retro gaming channels. It was, it was really great. Ah, there's Mr. Dindy again. He was, uh, or Dandy, I think he pronounces it. He was, he was quite good fun. Ah, and there's Nutty. He's quite a big streamer who I follow. He, he won't care about us at all. Um, but I, I like his channel. He does like, I tell you what, we will go there because I know some of you here are interested in OBS and Nutty is, has got the most insane OBS setup. So we will, we will do this. We're going to get, we're going to go there. So let me just get this set up, turn that off, um, and close that down. So let's do raid. There we go. Here we go. We'll start a raid. We're going to go and visit Nutty and hang around in there. You'll have not seen OBS uh, manipulated like this, I don't think. So thank you all very much for coming, everyone. Um, let's head over to Nutty's channel and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.